Hi friends, my name is Borro Dante. Let's talk about detailing and blending. So many people recently asked me how do I go around detailing stuff in real time without incredibly fast time-lapsing that I have in the episodes and specifically how do I do blending to just smooth colors between rough strokes. So I thought we'd share some time to discuss that kind of stuff and for that we'll use this unfinished painting I have that I started a long time ago and never got to finish it. The name is The Princess is Attending a Funeral. It may be a continuation to the painting The Sick Prince Arrived Despite the Storm that I used in one of my older tutorial-ish videos. But anyway, this painting has a lot of rough strokes and some of the areas are blended somehow. But mostly I'm on a very early search stage here. So I thought, let's just, I don't know, do something with this. Hmm, there's a few stages in here. This and this. So about detailing and blending, there is a basic technique that any average and higher digital artist knows. The technique of transparency and the color picker. Which basically means that at first you paint something by choosing colors from the palette, deciding what you put on when there's like nothing there yet. Mm, like this. Say there's some kind of golden pattern on uh, the princess outfit like this. We'll probably add more of that on the rest of this black garment that she has. But here's the thing, right? We added something, just quickly defining spots, whatever. This is anyone goes differently about it. But after that, since I have most of the colors that I need on the painting already, all the unique colors. Now I can hide the palette. I don't need it anymore. I have all the colors right here. So what I'll be doing now is using the transparency of the brush stroke, like this kind of level of transparency, and the color picker to be able to blend colors together the way I want them to be. So I'm picking colors here. I'm doing it really quickly. I'm doing it so quickly that I'm not just using the Alt key as a hotkey to pick the colors from the canvas. I actually use my side button. My side button is the color picker button. In a way that I don't even have to click on the surface of the screen, I just tap it while hovering it and I'm picking colors right away. Because this is one of the most important things that you do all the time. So now we go around and we just add details. Don't expect this to look any good in the end, because when I'm explaining things, I don't tend to think about what I'm actually painting. So, yeah, it's gonna suck. But let's imagine we have an idea what we're doing. So I'm looking for the symmetry here and all. I'm constantly, I even like forget to mention it, I constantly pick colors from here to add here. And at a certain point, I would want to add like semi-shadow areas. So I'll grab, what I'll do, for instance, if I wouldn't have any, like, blended colors yet, I would make a soft stroke, and I would choose the amount of blending between the two colors that I want, then I can even undo the stroke, and paint with this semi-shadow color of the gold now. And again, switching back to the bright gold, to the dark main material color, and so on and so forth. Constantly doing it, I don't even think about what exactly I do, I just, I need that color, I grabbed it immediately and just move on. So, one thing, uh, this detail in the middle, it's supposed to be a circle, but one thing we can't do is just draw a circle. Because drawing a circle on the canvas will mean that this is a circle on a canvas. Which is not what we need. We need a circle on this outfit. And for that you have to kind of create a certain touch to every tiny detail, any tiny silhouette about this object. Let me show you. Basically, I created a very rough, quick kind of circle at first, and I didn't care about creating it perfectly defined, very straight, because I still don't need it. I don't have to waste my time on that. And after that, I go around the circle and create a whole bunch of tiny strokes, just cutting away little bits of things that I don't need. 
And I don't just do it because it's easier this way to draw a perfect circle that is not crooked in a way. I do it because what we actually need is this whole mass like this. Sometimes details become sharp, sometimes they go split into the half tone, and this is the way they should be in the final result. They should look like there's a lot of different layers in a way, not just layers, but a lot of like touches of the detail going on. That's one thing that I actually discovered kind of recently, maybe half a year ago, that you have to define details this way, you have to touch them back and forth from the outer color and the inner color. You should constantly fight on the edge of the object, of the edge of every detail. This creates this oddly satisfying illusion of infinite definition of the object. Like, it feels like there's so many touch to absolutely everything that it looks just right. Even when it's not right. And even if it's perfectly right but absolutely sharp, it's gonna look wrong. To make it clear to some of you, imagine awesome artwork of some manga artist on paper and compare it to a very clean vector version of that artwork. Vector looks super clean, but it always looks gross. Because there's no touch to it, it looks not resolution-wise empty, but content-wise empty. So this is really important to constantly like touch your details and the way these details will go and how exactly to leave these details in the end, that comes with certain amount of experience and every artist does it differently. But it's definitely worth paying some attention to this kind of technique. Even more interesting, this effect will work about the hair or like eyebrows in here. The details that are basically infinitely complex. Hair is so tiny that you would spend your whole life trying to actually paint every hair. And it will look disgusting. This is something you shouldn't do. And this is a very important little thing. You have to accept the fact that you can't perfectly define anything. This is really important to deal with it. So basically, I'm looking at an eyebrow and I'm trying to understand where my level of details stop. And for an amateur, usually it goes, okay, if I'm limiting the details, I'm limiting all the hairs and I'm just creating a one soft stroke to define the whole eyebrow. How do I go any further? Well, here's the thing. Imagine you are trying to paint like this amount of hairs sticking back and forth like this. This is like a very close image, like we're seeing every hair individually. But we can't paint it like this, because again, if one hair is a detail, what you will have to do is to create a touch on the hair from the outside and the inside to define its perfect shape, because you never can end up with just one cylindrical stroke of your actual brush. It will always look gross. So you have to define it back and forth, back and forth, until you have just the right perfect shape of your hair. And it will be transparent here and there. This transparency is really important on many levels. And in case of a lot of hairs, it's even more important because really from the distance what you have to do is kind of like make a stroke uh, it's kind of hard to understand, but it's a stroke not of the hair and not of the no hair, but kind of like a semi-transparent mass of hairs and no hairs. <laughs> well, the best comparison would be the anti-aliasing effect in video games. In old video games, any object would have an edge that would look like this. A very sharp switch from object to no object. And that's it. It kind of makes sense, but that's why an object in general will look very weird and have these visual steps all over its edge. So that's really close to what you do when you try to define every hair. You still can't do it, it still will look weird. 
Because as a video game only has a certain amount of pixels to visualize everything, you have only certain scale of your brush strokes to define all the details. So, as a video game needs to go softer about their details and have these metal color pixels in between that define something in the middle of object and no object. The same way you have to think. Blending something and make something transparent with your strokes on their edges doesn't mean that the edge is actually transparent, like if it's a cloud or something or a fog. It can be anything and it should be anything. Everything should have a certain amount of transparency on their edges. But that's kind of easy to understand when you're talking about just one object. But when it's hairs, or any kind of detail where there's a lot more of it than you can easily visualize clearly, you have to think with this blending away. So right here, I may have meant that there is hair like this, and there's another hair like this, and there's probably some cluster of hair like that, but I didn't paint every single hair. I just blended them together into a little bit less opaque stroke of the hair color and some more opaque stroke right here. That basically means that inside of this stroke, this less opaque one, there's maybe three or four hairs stuck somehow together into a kind of curl or whatever. And in here, there's a lot more, like 12 to 15 hairs maybe. That's why it looks more opaque. In this area, hair is mostly what happens inside of these pixels. And in here, hair somewhat share the space of these pixels with the skin behind them. Because there's also a lot of skin we can see through the hairs. To make it work, you just have to paint a semi-transparent stroke, in a way. Meaning you blend the color between the hair and the skin. Even though there's no such thing as actually semi-transparent hairs. Well, in a way, but you know what I mean. And absolutely all details should go like this. This is yet another reason why I like so much working in one layer. Because as you can see right here, the search is blending into the sky everywhere. I actually made strokes of the color between the color of the object and the color of the sky. Which like... Why would you do that? Like, this thing is not actually semi-transparent. And if you zoom out, there is no impression that it's actually semi-transparent. It just looks like we kind of can't see it very well, like it's blurry or something. But it's not blurry, it's smudged. Because the resolution of the painting is not in pixels, but in the strokes. You have to anti alize the strokes. So, in this case, a lot of the time you just pick up the color of this semi-transparency and just start making bigger strokes like this. And right now I'm creating the effect of like the edges of the eyebrow, where there's always less hairs than the sky in this case, the skin. And then I grab a more opaque color of the hair and I add them on top. This is where you constantly think about the actual shape. This is the design of your strokes. This is super important to really think through where these strokes go. Are they too repetitive or not? Are they not creating the actual shape of an eyebrow? Do they look boring? Do they look like something's just off? You have to solve all of the problems of a little... Like you have to be very picky about your strokes. So I made a bunch of strokes, these are less opaque, this one is a bit more strong, but they all have more or less the same width. So now I'll make the stroke of a, a bit of a bigger scale, just because they shouldn't all be of the same size, because that would look too repetitive. That's the kind of thing you also have to think about, because this is not an actual eyebrow, this is the strokes of an eyebrow. And strokes are a kind of abstraction. And in abstraction, you have to think with not the hairs, but a completely independent from the actual geometry pattern. It's a thing, trust me. So, and then I'll add maybe a couple of noticeably very tiny ones, like this. And maybe like here and here. And there's a weird eyebrow like that. 
And I may have a bit of a problem with this sharp edge in the beginning, because that's where hairs naturally start growing, and that bottom edge of an eyebrow would usually appear softer. Because at the top area, a bunch of hairs stick together and create a sharp figure, but at the bottom they can't stick together because they just grow out, they just get out of the skin. So they would kind of like be more evenly spread. So we blend this area away. But then we should also think about that they shouldn't all stick together, like start sticking together at the same time. Some of them will do that earlier than the other ones. Otherwise it will look too repetitive and perfect. So I'll create an one early kind of cluster of hairs right here to create a bit of an extra mess. And when we zoom out, it's quite a massive eyebrow because, again, I don't even know where this eyebrow could be, but <laughs> that's a pretty nice eyebrow to look at. And it looks like there's a lot of hair in there, but we didn't paint a single actual hair. Now, one last thing. Now we covered a very basic, very technical side of detailing, and we talked about how to blend between colors with the color picker. So basically for blending you always have to use a brush that you can make sure that it will be very transparent if you press slightly. In that case it's a lot easier to like do this and you can easily grab semi-color and paint with that like this is my actual color now. Or grab the full color or very transparent one on the edge. It's very easy to pick it up otherwise it will have to stick to very edges where there's a split of actual pixels. It's really hard. So make sure that your brush is easily getting transparent where you need it. Just so you would have a much more convenient color palette on your canvas to grab colors from. But that's a traditional transparency color picker blending. Let's now mention a different one and that will be it. A different one is an actual digital blender, which is either a smudge tool, but I use it for different purposes, and there is a mixer brush tool in Photoshop. In Krita, there's, you can make almost any brush blending, but I prefer to use actual color brushes for color and blending brushes as clean blenders with no color in them. So in this case, I chose this blender brush and it doesn't have its own color, it's just smearing color together. And it's kind of also a good way, as you can see, this is the reason why I use actual mixer brush and not smudge tool, it's because you can make the mixer brush to have this texture. Mixer brush can blend with the texture in it. This one, texture. If you would choose the smudge tool, this thing would be unavailable. But anyway, this tool is a bit less controllable as your perfect strokes with color picking, in a classical transparency and color picking blending. But in some cases, when you don't need to be very precise, it's a lot faster and very smooth, because it's not overlaying transparent strokes, it's actual smearing together. So it may work a lot better for you in that sense. Sometimes you just want to get rid of certain sharp edge, just because you want to define something else, or sometimes blending an edge away like this is a way of stylized representation of something that is very detailed, but we like skip that detail at all. Like we blend it away to avoid defining a sharp edge because there is no sharp edge in there. There's something complex in there, but we kind of like make uh, an impression that there's a big stroke that is defining something in between. It's kind of like taking the idea of blending several hairs together in one semi-transparent stroke, but to a much bigger scale. There may be a whole bunch of different leaves on a branch of a tree that you can just define once with a very transparently green brush stroke and that's it and just leave it there. It will look satisfying to the eye because it's undefined and it looks undefined. It's a very weird and complex thing to master and I'm still far from mastering it but I recently started appreciating blending colors more, like very recently, maybe two weeks ago or something. But it really pays off a lot. And what's interesting, sometimes you can blend away like this, and then it will be easier to like pick up colors and somewhat accurately, not very aggressively, 
start defining some details using these colors, increasing the contrast of them a little bit from this super smooth fog of the mass of details. And just it makes things easier to search. So for me it doesn't matter if I'm blending on the surface, on a detail, between the surface and the detail, between the surface and its background. Everything has to be blended together and everything has to be defined together. Nothing has to like stick away completely. Sometimes strokes have to like just combine all the matter together in the flow of the strokes. So you really have to think with all of that together. And it's a lot easier that way to define everything. If you just let go the idea of sticking to a precise well-defined surface it's not a surface, it's just a reflected light. It's all the same thing. This weird ball and that sky, it's the same thing. Think a lot more about optical effects of the light instead of effects of the surfaces. Your life will be a lot easier. So there, as you can see, I blended things around. To help you search these non-definitive ways of working with edges, of all the objects and details, think of it as like any object has its own flow of strokes. Like a spherical object has, there's a lit area, so we have like this kind of idea, we're creating this spherical feeling of light and it's going away into shadow. And this one has like the opposite thing going on because it's an indent thing. But behind it, there's sky that has maybe like this, something undefined because it has no actual direction. Sky is a perfect gradient. So basically, it gets brighter a bit at the bottom, it gets darker at the top. So its lines would go kind of like this. And that means that where the strokes should go. But on the edges between any two objects that have their own strokes, there is a collision of flows. And that's where this turbulence going on. And you have to like dance with it. And that's what looks really pretty if you do it right. So we kind of imagine that this hits this thing, kind of something blends into one another and it creates a common color together for a little while and that splits away again. Yeah, I think that's a cool way to think about it. This is like a collision of different flows that creates a turbulence. So basically every edge is like a battle between one object and another one. So yeah, hopefully this all makes sense. I really never heard anyone talking about it because this feels like a very in-between kind of thing. No one usually manages to like pay attention to this particular idea. Maybe they do in art schools, but I never went there, so <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, this is it for now on blending and detailing. Hopefully this will help you somehow. I know you probably have no idea how to apply it, but just keep thinking in this direction and try to find your ways of going around edges, because edges of objects are very important. A lot of the times you know what the object should look like, but still when you paint it, it looks like crap just because you don't know how to make your strokes convincing enough about what this object is and that it's actually there. So yeah, give it a try. And I thank you for watching if you did. I guess you did if you're here. Leave a like and subscribe. Tell a friend. Blend away. Do whatever you want. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.